presentations that took place for our first conference, which was last November 16th with Dr. Yasmin Irisari and, and Dr. A.J. Alvero, who gave their, um, who shared their amazing work on, you know, HSIs and intersectionality and looking at STEM and what we could do to improve um, student success. So today, as you know, <clears throat> and I don't know if you all um, received the notice that due to unforeseen circumstances, Dr. Michelle Espino is not able to be with us today. So I'm pinch hitting and um, I am going to share a presentation that I made for the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Ed two years ago, but it's very relevant to the kinds of questions that we want to pose here and the kinds of um, research that might inform how we could advance student success. But in the meantime, for anyone who's joined, um, please in the chat, your name, uh, affiliation, and what one or two words come to mind when you hear the word community of practice. And I hear interdependence ecology, that's from Fel Felicia. I hear the whole community. I hear learning together, I love this. I hear um, working to end, um, and this is from Juan, and, uh, end institutional racism and promote parity, especially for faculty and leadership. I hear student success working together. This is from Travis and Antoinette writes, done by the community for the community and co-creation. These are gorgeous. I'm so happy that everyone's sharing their words of wisdom about what a community of practice is. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start so that at 1045, we will convene again, have small um, group breakout, maybe four people to a group so that we can uh, digest and ask questions about the presentation. So I'm going to keep the words coming about what a community of practice means to you and uh, your name and affiliation. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and screen this video. As I said, um, it is on YouTube, but we will have the Q&A live after this. And co-founder of the Institute for the Study of Bienvenido Familia. Welcome, family. My name is Nancy Lopez. And I am professor of sociology. I'm also director and co-founder of the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice. And I currently serve as associate vice president for the Division of Equity and Inclusion at the University of New Mexico. It's my great pleasure to talk to you today about some of the work that I've been doing to advance equity through the use of intersectionality. So the talk today will be can intersectional analysis of graduation, advanced race, gender, class equity in higher education, evidence from a Hispanic serving institution in the Southwest. Before we start, I'd like to start by um, recognizing that we are on indigenous land. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia, the original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land through the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. Here's just a bio slide that just gives you a snapshot of some of the research that I've done over the last 26 years as a faculty member, as well as a current research that is funded through the WT Grant Foundation that is looking at how ethnic studies high school courses reduce inequalities in Albuquerque, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. What are my conversation goals today? I'd like to have a conversation about what is intersectionality? What does that look like in terms of inquiry and practice? What are the race, class, gender gaps and inequities that we need to pay attention to if we're trying to advance equity in higher ed? How can we play a role in improving the data that we do collect for equity use? And then lastly, I hope we have time to have a discussion about what three things will you do to catalyze intersectional inquiry, methods, and practice for equity? So this is really an invitation to critical and self-implicating reflexivity about our own location and systems of inequality. So throughout the presentation, I want you to reflect on where you are in terms of the individual level, the institutional level, your community, and all these other levels, municipal, state, and federal, 
so that we can practice what we preach, right? Intersectional solidarity and justice, walking the talk. So the focus of my presentation will be on why intersectionality is necessary, right? For looking at complex inequalities in higher ed. And how do we move from compliance-oriented data analysis to equity transformation? First, I'll start with a brief definition of intersectionality, which is a way of understanding and analyzing complexity. When it comes to social inequality, people's lives and the organization of power in a given society are better understood as being shaped not by a single axis of division, whether it's race or gender or class, but many axes that work together and influence each other. People use intersectionality as an analytical tool to solve problems. And this comes from Collins and Bilge, their work, um, their book called Intersectionality. So this is just a basic definition. I also want to honor that this work comes from the legacy of many Black, Indigenous, Latina, uh, Asian, other women of color who have always made the case for the importance of understanding the convergence of race, gender, and class and other systems of inequality, sexuality, uh, citizenship. And so I cited Patricia Hill Collins, but we know that we have Ansaldua, we have um, Mary Romero, Hancock, Sambrana, all of whom have contributed to the, this inquiry and praxis. I wanted to share this email with you because it comes from a program officer who challenged the possibility of doing research on this area. And I was sending an inquiry that said, I wanted to do intersectional analysis for equity use. And this was his response to me. And this is a very competitive um, funding agency. He says, intersectionality is a stand-in for analytical laziness. Perhaps a better way would be to focus on race or gender or class. There are problems with being poor, independent of race and gender. There are problems with gender, irrespective of race or class. And there are problems and disparities with race, irrespective of gender or class. There are plenty of poor white men and women who suffer from very serious problems, and our system doesn't address that. Now, this only uh, I share with you to show that there's a lot of misunderstanding about what intersectionality is, and really that we um, have a responsibility to educate people about the value added by looking at all of these social inequalities together. And so this is a special issue that I co-edited and I have an empirical paper there that is called Making the Invisible Visible, Quantitative Methods Through Critical Race Theory and Intersectionality for Revealing Complex Race, Gender, Class, Inequalities in Education. And it's a special issue, again, of race, ethnicity, and education. And I'm going to share some of the findings. So what we did was look at graduation rates for men and women. As you can see, typically women do graduate at higher rates in every group, but the racial gap remains, right? Um, in general, when we look at descriptive statistics that say, well, what percent of um, individuals at this university that shall remain nameless as per institutional review board protocols, um, we can say, oh, 41% graduated in six years. Oh, 30% or so um, took remedial math or English or any remedial was 43%. You know that more women are in college than men, so 58% are women. And uh, here's the demographics in this institution. We have about 41% of the population that's white, 3% black, 44% Hispanic. That's an incredibly high number. 7% Native American, American Indian, also a very high number, 5% Asian, and more than half are um, Pell eligible, indicating um, some financial uh, need. So when we use intersectionality to look at graduation rates at this public university in the Southwest that's Hispanic serving, we find, uh, we make visible inequities that would remain invisible if we simply asked, well, how many Hispanics are graduating or how many whites are graduating or how many men or how many women or how many people on low income or on Pell, et cetera. So what this shows is the probability, these are not graduation rates, but the probability, the likelihood 
that someone graduates compared to high income white women. These are all students that graduated from a high school in the state, meaning that um, this represents 80% of the undergrads. Um, this is again, a Hispanic serving institution in the Southwest. So I want you to um, find yourself on this uh, chart. In my case, I am a US born Dominican woman, black Latina, um, and grew up in a very low income household in New York City, in fact, in public housing. So if I were to look at this uh, result, I would say, where am I? Okay, Hispanic low income woman, that means that I am 23% less likely to graduate than a high income white woman, which is our reference group. What about low income white women? Well, it turns out that they're only 14% less likely to graduate. So this is why an intersectional lens is so important. And this is why when you look at policies that assume that income, you know, like if you are just providing uh, supports to people who receive Pell grants or are considered low income, that we're addressing the race gap, that we're addressing a race gender gaps, According to intersectional analysis, that is not the case at this university. So I, I ask you, what are the ways in which we could challenge the data collection that's happening at our universities to make sure that we have a robust measure of class? This sample only included 40% of students who answered the income question. So that means that we would not have a class measure for a good number of the students. So think about what other measure you would use and why is reporting by race, by gender or class alone insufficient for ameliorating inequality. These two next slides, I'm not gonna spend as much time on, but this again shows why an intersectional analysis that considers a lived position. So is it the case that white low-income women are placed in remedial English classes as often as our American Indian low-income women? No, it's not. In fact, they're only 8% uh, uh, as likely to be placed. But for American Indian low-income women, it's 40%. So this is, again, another way of making the invisible visible. Let's look at math. These are um, developmental course um, placement. When we look at uh, low-income Hispanic men, there are 15% less like, uh, more likely to be placed in those classes compared to um, if we look at white low-income men, they're actually less likely to be placed in those classes. So again, intersectionality helps make the invisible visible so that you can create equity lifts for all of these students. If there's an inequity, we can make it visible and then rectify it. So um, the next iteration of this study is one that is going to build on some preliminary work that we've done, the descriptive statistics mostly, not um, probabilities, that examines at the University of New Mexico in this case. And so this is what is the graduation rate in, uh, uh, for six years by just race? Again, this is not intersectional, but again, keep in mind why this is not enough and why at a Hispanic serving institution, we need much more detail. This is just, again, a first stab at looking at cohort graduation. These are five-year graduation rates. And I wanna call your attention again to why looking at the difference between Hispanic uh, first-generation men and white first-generation men is very telling. The first thing that I want you to do is look at what is the relative um, difference between, these are all first year students. How many first year students that are white men are first gen? If you look at that number on the first column, it says 42. 174 are continuing generation, meaning one parent has a four-year college degree. That means that the vast majority of young white men who are at the university are actually continuing generation. They're not first gen. But even within that, you do see that there is a difference, right? Among white first gen men, um, only 
33% are graduating within five years compared to continuing gen where it's almost half, right? So there is a difference, but let's look at for the Hispanic um, first gen men. Well, there the numbers change dramatically. It's not a fraction of the population that's first gen. It's uh, practically, um, let's see, almost half, right? So 134 <laughs> of the men are first in their families to go beyond high school, to go to college and have a, a you know a college degree or don't come from a household where one parent has a four-year degree. But for um, Hispanics, it is a lot more, right? And um, you see that there is a difference in graduation clearly, right? 34% of the first gen Hispanic men are graduating in five years compared to almost half, I mean, 47%. So there is a difference. This is again, what is the reason why this matters? Because we wanna make the invisible visible and help reduce these inequalities. Um, uh, this just shows the picture in terms of who returns. So if we look at um, last fall for American Indian first gen, only 56% returned in fall 2020. But then when we look at continuing generation, meaning one parent has a four-year college degree, almost 81% returned. So again, just showing you the value added by an intersectional lens. This is a special issue that I encourage you all to um, keep in your radar. It is being uh, published by the American Educational Research Association, AERA. And um, the paper that we will be submitting is looking at this very question. Is reporting graduation rates by Hispanic alone, race alone, gender alone, or first gen status alone sufficient for advancing equity? the urgency of practicing intersectionality for policy and practice at Hispanic serving institutions, but I would add at any institution, right? It, uh, whether it's historically black, whether it's a tribal college, whether it's a predominantly white um, college, intersectionality can make invisible inequities visible. And uh, my co-authors, um, Dr. Christopher Irwin, um, as well as uh, Vice President for Equity and Inclusion, Astata Sarai, uh, Monica Ginbret, uh, Diane Torres Velasquez, and Cynthia Weiss, among others, who are joining us in this effort to examine inequities. So I want you to think back to when you were 16 years old. What was the highest degree or level of, of education that your parents had, right? Was it completed in the United States or abroad? Um, so it really doesn't matter whether or not your parents were um, earning a college degree in a foreign country or in the United States, that is a very different experience than someone like, in my case, my family immigrated from the Dominican Republic. And even though I was born here, they never had the opportunity to go beyond elementary school. So that's a very different experience. So again, consider how you can change the data collection. Um, do you collect Hispanic origin or ancestry data separate from race? Um, do you collect data on gender or sexual orientation? What about um, disability? Those are all things that I want you to think about. This is just a snapshot of the, um, the neighborhood that I grew up in in New York City. Um, it's the Lower East Side. It's public housing on the right where I grew up. And across the street was co-ops. And as you can see, zip code is not enough for um, determining the social uh, determinants of educational opportunity or even health or anything else. So keep in mind that although well-intentioned, the idea that the SAT is going to now use zip code as a proxy for disadvantage might actually be hiding inequities. Why not use parental educational attainment in an intersectional way? This is simply a way for you, a tool for you to use when you think about the funding formulas in your state. For instance, in New Mexico, it is assumed that health status is reaching the achievement gap by race, but um, as you can see, the empirical evidence shows otherwise. So thinking about the possibility of instead using intersectionality, looking at race, gender, and class equity as the driving force of funding formulas for advancing equity. Here are some uh, examples of the types of questions that we could use for gender identity. 
including things like non-binary, transgender, and for sexual orientation, bisexual, gay, heterosexual, letting people also write in. So that's one way of also um, capturing data on students who might be experiencing a major inequity but remain invisible. And of course, considering that this is an optional question, that this is something that people can opt into and how you could use this data for equity use and connecting students for, to resources. Another good question is, what does it mean to honor tribal sovereignty when we collect data on indigenous communities? And how do we rectify the harm that might happen when you are not honoring this principle? So one thing is, if you are going to collect this data, how are you doing that in harmony with that value? So one suggestion is um, asking separately, are you an enrolled member and listing that? Or how do you identify and what are your origins? But again, with that principle of tribal sovereignty in place. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, to talk about the urgency for Hispanic serving institutions, but again, I would say at any institution to make sure that we use intersectionality when we're collecting data on Hispanic communities, on Latinx communities. And this comes from an article that was written by Maxime Bacazin and uh, Ruth Sambrana, who's author of Toxic Ivory Tower. Um, and they make the case that you know, I'll, I'll just read the quote. It says, we caution that Latino Latinas as a social construct must be problematized. It's complicated by differences in national origin, in citizenship, in race, class, ethnicity, and the confluence of these factors. An intersectional approach acknowledges these differences and seeks to reveal and understand how they shape experience. So keep that nugget with you as I share with you um, how this particular um, participant who attended a conference where I talked about this new measure of race I call street race, which basically says, if you were walking down the street, what race do you think others who don't know you would assume you are? And this was her unsolicited email a couple of years ago. She says, Dr. Lopez, I attended the conference and very much enjoyed your street race lecture as someone whose street race is white, but has a grandmother that immigrated from Latin America it's made me think a lot about my own journey in understanding my relationship to race and ethnicity. It's something that I'm beginning to grapple with, and it has caused a fair amount of discomfort as well as excitement. I was wondering if you have any book recommendations for someone who's just beginning to explore these issues in her own life. Now, this is what I call practicing critical reflexivity because here is this woman recognizing that of course she is Latina, of course she has a grandmother, she named the country in South America, but recognizing that her cousins who may be brown skin or um, darker skin, considered black, um, Afro, uh, South American, whatever, may be experiencing a different street race when they walk down the street. This is just a reference to uh, an essay that I published in theconversation.com that is called The Census Bureau Keeps Confusing Race and Ethnicity, where I detail this question that um, I referred to earlier, what's your street race? And if you were walking down the street, what race do you think strangers would assume you are based on what you look like? And the beauty of this question is that it challenges the myth of race as biology, genetic ancestry, or culture, and instead focuses on race as a social relationship of power that is not just about your personal identity. Our research shows that when you use this street race measure in studies about inequality, you can make visible inequities that would otherwise remain hidden if we only ask, how do you identify? So it's always important to include at least two questions when you ask about race. How do you identify, which is always included, and that's very important, but we can't stop there. We also have to ask, how do you think others see your race? Equally important is making sure that you mark one box in the 2020 census or any school form when you're asked the race question, and that is so that we can detect housing discrimination. President Obama, for instance, only marked one box in the 2010 census. And imagine if Obama were walking down the street looking for an apartment or um, accessing health care, do you think anybody would think he's white? And that's why I think it's super important for us to consider the equity use 
of when you answer that street that race question for civil rights use. These are the um, published articles that use that measure in a survey, a national survey of Latinos in the country. And of course, we find nothing surprising there, right? Those of us who, like me, look black and brown or Arab or anything that is, uh, is not white report more instances of discrimination and also experience more adverse outcomes in terms of mental health that would remain invisible if we were just asking people, well, how do you identify? So um, you can look up those uh, articles. Here's a visual that I often use to kind of illustrate that, you know, probably all of these men, whether it's David Ortiz, Ricky Martin, and George Lopez are mixed race. I think everyone will probably have ancestors that walked all over this earth, right? However, if they mark five boxes when they're being asked what is their race, we would have an, an we would be unable to examine if the rich the racialization that is experienced by David Ortiz is similar to that experienced by Ricky Martin or George Lopez when they go through security in an airport, when they try to access an apartment, when they they show up at an emergency room, or even while um, uh, walking across campus. So that is why again, um, looking critically at how we collect race data on Latinos in particular, but for all, all groups is incredibly important. And I add that family members of the same ethnicity can and should answer the race question differently to reflect their unique racial status. They may all be Puerto Rican, they may all be Dominican, they may all be Mexican, but they may be racialized very differently, right? This is just a visual that makes that point more clear by saying it's not enough to stop at just asking your identity, but we have to ask that street race question. Sometimes people call it socially assigned race, like Kamara Jones. Others call it ascribed race. We also have to ask questions about lived experience. Have you experienced unfair treatment and accessing healthcare or um, walking across campus, microaggressions, all of that? And that, of course, uh, indigenous data must be anchored in indigenous sovereignty principle for any data collection, do no harm. Should we create a separate question on tribal enrollment? That has to be done with a way that honors um, tribal sovereignty. Ethnicity matters, absolutely. I describe my own ethnicity as Dominican and my generational status is totally different than my parents. They were not born in, in the United States. Um, uh, even though Spanish is my first language, I was schooled in um, the United States. So it's a, those are important things to understand, the food ways, the cultural practices, um, my husband is Chicano from New Mexico, has never migrated. This was Mexico before this became, you know, um, the United States. So understanding the cultural difference is important, but we should never confuse that with race, right? How are you racialized? This is just a visual that shows what all of us filled out um, in the 2020 census, but it really gets us to ask why it's dangerous to ask for two concepts and one question because it kind of implies that some origins are more representative of a nation than another. And so I always ask the Census Bureau whenever I'm on a panel with them, what box would you place Canadian, South African, or American linking a nationality and ancestry to a race box is the defini definition of, of racism. And I also ask the question, who benefits when we don't have good data? And remember I mentioned marking five boxes, how is that gonna help us understand the color line in educational opportunity in health and housing? Um, so another possibility is avoiding false equivalencies, right? So are you the US descendant, are you African-American and descendant of US slavery or are you African immigrant? Those are not the same kinds of experiences. You may be both racialized as Black, but understanding the unique experiences of the um, descendants of U.S. slavery might be an important question. Are you of Hispanic origin? Absolutely. Understanding what is the, your cultural heritage, your ancestral background, that's important. It is not the case that the experiences of um, Dominicans is similar to Mexicans. There are differences, there's historical reasons for that. And so capturing that nuance is important. So separating Hispanic origin from race. And then, as I said, for race, making sure that people understand that this is for civil rights enforcement. 
For the purposes of this question, race is defined as a social status based on the meanings given to your physical appearance, not just your skin color, but your hair texture, other visual markers, that is not equivalent to culture, ethnicity, or whatever your DNA test, right? Please mark only one box that is your primary identity for civil rights monitoring and enforcement. So these are all just suggestions to, again, clarify. Are the experiences of people according to their street race shaping their access to opportunity? This is a wonderful um, chart that comes from Rogelio Sainz and Cristina Morales, Latinos in the United States, Diversity and Change. And they show why it is super important to disaggregate the educational outcomes of Latinos by um, place of birth, by gender, and also by national origin. So let's look at Mexican. If we look at the percentage of US born people who say that they are Mexican, only 14, uh, less than 14% have a college degree. And for women, it's a little higher, it's 16%. But let's look at Colombian. Well, if you find out that for the U.S. born Colombian, 37%, more than double of Colombians have a college degree compared to, uh, and for the women, it's even higher, it's 46%. So this just gives you a glimpse as to why intersectional analysis of the educational outcomes of Latinos is key for understanding how to provide equity lifts, what my colleague Ruth Zambrana calls equity lifts. The same is true in terms of looking at, um, in, you know, um, returns to education and also um, wages. Here's just a snapshot from the census that was done in 2010 that shows, again, there's stark differences. So Dominicans, we have the lowest number of people checking white on the census, only about less than a third. But if you look at Cubans, 85%. For Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, it's pretty even about half. And for South Americans, it's two thirds. So again, many of these inequities, as I mentioned earlier, map on to racialization, right? The color line. And who's racialized as white, who's racialized as brown, who's racialized as black. These are all the studies that show the preponderance of evidence shows that there is a color line in the Latino community. So um, those Latinos who identify as white tend to live in census tracts that experience lower levels of poverty, like much lower. Uh, how, uh, Hogan's um, 2017 um, research on that shows that. But also when we even look at something like criminal justice, right? The, um, the experiences of Latinos vary by race. So again, recognizing that an intersectional lens makes us understand the convergence of all these differences. This is just a visual that I use to get people to engage in what I had described earlier, which is this practice of critically reflecting on your location and systems of inequality. I didn't create colorism. I didn't create heterosexism. I didn't create ableism. But if I'm not reflecting on where I'm located in these systems of inequality, then I may be blind to someone else's inequality. I may not be paying attention to how in, um, systems of inequality are privileging some groups and not others. This is another wonderful visual that in many ways brings that, expands on that point by saying, not only is it important to understand your social location and systems of inequality grids of power, but it's also important to understand people's narratives of identity and how they talk about themselves, their identities versus someone else, as well as their ethical and political commitments, keeping in mind that people who may come from the same families, from the same background, may have very different narratives of identity, very different ethical and political commitments. So how do we create complex understandings around identity? So again, I invite you to reflect, think back to when you were 16, what was your race, gender, and first generation college status um, in systems of power? What about now? What are your stories about yourself and who others are? What's your sense of belonging? What are your emotional attachments? What about now? And then finally, what are your ethical and political commitments at age 16 and now? I also want to caution that we do not uh, fall into the trap of making false equivalencies. So this idea that the new myths of equivalent oppressions in the United States to be a working class and lesbian black woman descendant of US slavery is not the same as to be a working class um, 
white gay men or working class brown Latino heterosexual men. Although all of these experiences are connected, they're not equivalent. Many privileged academics and others with occupational prestige claim a bit of oppression for themselves, but who benefits from this myth of equivalent and false, you know, from um, these false equivalencies and oppressions? Oppression talk becomes a fetish, a distraction from unjust power relations, right? So what do we do now? Our challenge is that we need to have clarity about how our data are collected and how that message is clarified for people at the point of data collection. We need transparency so that people understand if I'm marking five boxes, what is that gonna look like in terms of equity use, right? I also wanna invite you to the possibility of considering establishing an institutional um, archive of all the kinds of questions that your particular institution has collected on gender, on race, on class, so that you have a record across time how those things have changed. And then what was that, what is the way that we need to improve that data and the messaging of what that data are used for, right? Um, so some improvements is adding first generation for all students, I would even say for graduate students as well, and faculty and staff, right? So that we can see, are there patterns of inequality that we can make visible when we look at a first gen status and race and gender together? That we, in, in concert with tribal sovereignty, collect data on tribal status and origin, as well as on um, American descendants of US slavery, right? Um, that we improve our data collection on um, gender and sexual orientation for equity use with the understanding that that data cannot do harm. Right, it's not meant to do harm. Um, that we have to provide clarity. So when I, you do mark two boxes, how are you gonna be counted for graduation rates? Are you just gonna put into this mystery box or are you going to be able to choose at the point of that data collection to say, well, actually for graduation rates, this is how I wanna be identified for civil rights use. Um, make sure that the messaging is not just, oh, this is just a required question, but this is about our values our commitment to equity and justice in higher ed, um, et cetera. And maybe even consider creating a digital repository where you collect this data. Here's just um, some of the questions that are asked in Patricia Hill Collins' Black Feminist Thought, which is one of the key readings I would urge you all to read on intersectionality, to think about how power is arranged in your university. Who sits in a position of power? Who does the secretarial work? Who teaches most of the, the classes on campus and is paid equitably for that labor? What are the rules of the game for any, um, earning tenure for creating new classes? Who's in control of knowledge production? What counts as core requirements and elective requirements or elective um, credits? What are those lived positions? What are the stories and narratives and controlling images, the stereotypes that are used to justify why some groups are considered um, valuable and others are not. This is a visual here again, the matrix of domination is a key concept that really helps us unpack, you know, whether we're in Brazil, whether we're in South Africa, whether we're here in the Southwest uh, or in a Hispanic serving institution, what are those systems of inequality that have been their settler colonialism, white supremacy, uh, structural racism, patriarchy, and a nation, citizenship, et cetera. And then how is it organized in our organizations? How is power manifested in our the rules of the game, the techniques of surveillance, as well as in our lived experiences? And then on the left, you'll see a circle that talks about the hegemonic domain of power and the cultural domain of power, which is really those stories that we tell that maintain these systems of either inequality or systems of um, justice and equity. So finally, I'll um, suggest again that you visit our website. It's race.unm.edu, the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice. There you'll see a link to a site called Intersectionality and Consortium. And it was established in 2014 um, to really create a convergence hub um, a convergence space, a research design and methodology incubator that fosters the exchange of ideas and innovations, right? Strategies of how can we practice intersectionality, looking at race, gender, class together for equity use. So how do we shift the culture? Systems change, right? From equity 
from compliance to equity use. What are our values? Indigenous data sovereignty, inclusive leadership, community collaboration, attention to power dynamics, do no harm transparency, that commitment to critical self-reflection on our location and systems of inequality, even if we didn't create them. How do we advance accountability that's equity-based? How do we build on inter um, interdisciplinary knowledge? Not every um, discipline has the hold on knowledge. We need multiple epistemologies. We need new approaches, methods, and uh, we can do this. Um, I'll end by saying losing self-reflexivity represents a sure sign that one's beginning to sell out. And this comes again from Patricia Hill Collins, Fighting Words, Black Women in the Search for Justice. This is uh, another example of a curricular innovation that I invite all of your institutions to consider. And it is um, a race and social justice graduate certificate that is now open to community. You don't have to be a matriculated student. And it involves taking five classes and the catch is they have to be in different disciplines. So whether it's art history or public health or education or sociology or um, biology, anti-racism in biology, you will learn about race and social justice from many different angles. And we have it available for undergrads. We're the first in the country to establish that. And again, if we wait for the money to create innovation in institutions that are facing budget cuts, um, we miss some opportunities to create some real impact. And I will end it there and invite anyone who has any questions to um, take this opportunity to ask them. And I, I posed a few just to get us started. What is intersectional inquiry and practice? What would that look like in your neck of the woods? What are the race, gender, and class inequities in your context? What are the improvements that are needed, right, for data collection for equity use? And what three things will you do to catalyze intersectional inquiry, methods, and practice for equity? And I invite all of you to come visit us at the University of New Mexico. Um, here's my contact information. So you can always email me. You can visit our website. You can join our listserv. And again, invite you to continue asking these questions and how especially in Hispanic serving institutions, but in any institution, intersectionality could be used as a tool for making the invisible visible and for solving problems and advancing equity and justice. Thank you. Wonderful. So thank you for um, staying Hi, with everyone. us. Hi, Mark Barton here at Sandy Hook Promise. Okay. Uh, December 14th, I always, I never can uh, <laughs> turn this off, so uh, bear with me. Great classroom. Okay. I think I just found a way. Awesome. So what we're going to do now, and um, I'd like, I'd love to welcome Leslie Luqueño, who will be speaking in a little bit. But what I'd like to do now is have Lorena help me do breakout groups of no more than four, so that we can have about 15, 20 minutes to um, talk about how these insights uh, transfer to your particular HSI or institutional context. So I put in the chat the question that I want everyone to focus on, um, and we will return five minutes after the hour um, from the small group. Uh, the question is, how can these insights translate at your HSI? What three things can you do to catalyze intersectionality as inquiry and praxis in your HSI? And any other questions that come up to you? There was a lot of information that I gave out, and um, there's an associated paper um, with the main presentation that was talking about the use of intersectionality for um, examining uh, graduation. 